I don't know if you had a specific order you wanted to take things in or, um, you know, uh, maybe a description of how you, how you order, organize the work and your data collection and all that. Well, actually, I guess, I guess to, to, to start it off, because this is going to be a bit of a tag team, Lauren, can you go into a little bit about, from your coaching staff's perspective, um, I guess just your, your weekly structure, the performance meetings, and how you kind of take in data from strength conditioning ATs and then your, your coaches, and then I'll, I'll pop in from there. Perhaps that's the best place to start. Okay. You me, are we starting now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, on Monday mornings, we have what we call our performance meeting. So we'll bring in our athletic trainer, our strength and conditioning coach, our academic advisor, our dietitian, and our coaching staff. And we kind of lay out the plan for the week, um, what we want our training to look like. And David obviously also jumps in on those calls. Um, and he gives us our jump count numbers. Um, and with that, we kind of know if we want high, low, medium days, and our strength coach will put together his workouts accordingly. Um, and then as practices go, obviously, you know, we go in with a certain goal of jump counts, and then we see, okay, we hit that number, we went a little over, we need to go lighter tomorrow, we were a little light today, we can go heavier tomorrow, um, and just kind of take the feedback on how their body feels every day to determine what we want to do every day. Yeah, one of the one of the things I was listening to the the talk yesterday, John, as we mentioned, um, with with Luke going in with Mark on more of the strength conditioning side, and one of the things they were really talking about was in terms of data being subjective or objective that the importance of communication between uh, you know strength staff, athletic training, and and I think uh, Mark even mentioned Luke under. Was he said he didn't make it as uh, openly important as it really, really was um, for whatever reason? Is that that's critical? And one of the things that I really appreciate working with James Madison because I work with it's about you know anywhere from fifty to hundred programs reviewing data and things of that nature. Um, but in order to properly make sure that that Lauren or the head coach in general is uh, practice planning optimally, um, or that Robbie, their strength coach, is strength training optimally, there needs to be that, that beautiful communication. So I really love the fact that in these meetings, you have, you know, everyone kind of sitting at this table and me virtually sitting at the table, being able to say, all right, you know, based on what we want to do in practice, uh, Robbie, the strength coach will then say, here's kind of what I want to do in, in the weight room. Um, and then you know, we look at, for us, uh, for those not familiar, I know a lot of people are familiar with what Vert does. A lot of people look at it from the jump side because in volleyball, which is our main sport, that's the main metric utilized. But we're picking up a lot of information now. Um, and the the goal working with Lauren is to make sure that we just get, you know, snippets of, of key data points that are optimally useful. And that's what we'll kind of review in these, in these meetings to make sure that we put out the plan for the rest of the week um, to move forward on on training both on and off the court. Okay. Uh, de uh, first, let me do one housekeeping thing for, for the people, uh, for people who may not have been on these before. Feel free to shoot in questions whenever you want. I'll insert them wherever, you know, they, they seem to make sense in the conversation. So if something occurs to you, go ahead, type it in. The best way to do it is through the question and answer function rather than the chat just so we avoid it getting lost in any sort of conversation that's going on on that side. Um, okay. The, the, the kind of the initial question I had for you, David, was what is the vert device actually collecting now um, that you guys are then obviously processing and using? Sure. And, and this is pretty much across the board, but obviously we do this all with James and Madison and Lauren, but we have the, uh, in a nutshell, you're going to collect, obviously your jump counts, right? How many times the athlete's jumping? And those are jumps over about six inches. Uh, jump height, um, average high. So average high is essentially, we're going to look at the top 25% of their jumps, right? Because what we don't, don't, we don't want to do is, is penalize an athlete for celebratory hops or take those kind of float serve jumps into account when we're trying to gauge, you know, are they hitting those high numbers? So their average high number is, is essentially where we say they, they play at. And that's what we really look at uh, most specifically from a performance standpoint. Percent of max, 
Uh, programs do percent of max differently. What we try to have programs do is, and I think, I think Lauren, we did this beginning of the season where we just, we looked at the athletes. We took kind of their top three jumps from a few practices. So we got their, their top jumps on court, average those. And then we had, all right, we said that's, that's their, their max jump at the beginning of the season. And we put that in as a number. So we can then say, hey, we know that this player tends to play at, you know, 74% of her max, and we can trend throughout the season that way. Some of the newer metrics, uh, first and foremost, is uh, the landing impact. So that metric is very unique. That uh, is essentially that the, because the belt and the sensor sit around the waist, uh, we can visually see live how well an athlete is attenuating or absorbing that ground force from the ground up to their hips and back. Uh, so in a nutshell, what we like to make clear is, is we can see if a landing was low, medium, high, or what we call alert. And a low and medium landing doesn't mean good because we can't see that knee valgus where the knees are caving. Unfortunately, at this point, I can't tell you yet, it feels like right leg versus left leg. Um, but if it reaches a certain threshold of, of Gs, that's just like a peak acceleration, of 15 or higher, we can immediately flag that and we know definitively the athlete is landing stiffly. Uh, and in a nutshell, it's the difference between having, you know, a little bit of hip flexion or not having that hip flexion or minimal knee flexion. Um, any coaches listening now pretty much know what you're talking about, right? I mean, you can hear it usually <laughs> <laughs> when they essentially jackhammer. Um, and that's been almost ridiculously powerful in terms of being able to flag uh, higher injury risk athletes. And, and then the other key metric we have, you know, like a hundred of them, but in terms of maximum useful is, is now the sensor actually picks up uh, anything the athlete does that's basically beyond walking. So, so any dynamic movement and, and what that will allow us to do is, is measure their, their energy, and uh, for our research folks, we, we measure it in energy in joules per pound, right? As Lauren can attest, she, she would prefer not to get a report of she was at 5,217 joules per pound and she was at 3,815 joules per pound. Um, because frankly, as coaches, you, you, you want a snapshot. I'll kind of go into how we use that number with JMU and with other programs. Um, but to any kind of strength, uh, physio, athletic training folks listening, the one of the ways that number is used on the, the sports performance side is energy is a, is a measure of movement economy, right? And, and again, we, we do review this with certain players because you might be having athletes do the same practice, right? You have two middles, they each jump 100 times for the sake of argument about the same height. And yet one of them is always, you know, 30% higher energy than the other, right? That has meaning. And what that essentially is telling us is that player is doing 30% more work or having 30% more impact on his or her body based on how they move. So I would almost guarantee you they're landing harder. Uh, they're a bit more flat footed. And so mechanically, because that's what we're measuring, there's a little more strain on their body. But when we were kind of going through this um, with Lauren and her staff and other number of other programs, they want to look at it more based off of uh, how can we use that based off of match energy. So what we started to do is you can tag either live in the iPad app or post. You can tag different drills or you can tag sets, right? So Emily, the athletic trainer for, for James Madison, would tag every set in every match. Um, as well as specific drills in practice so that we would understand after a few matches, what is each athlete's average demand or energy per set played? Now, instead of looking at it at 5,200 joules per pound, Lauren can sit there and say, hey, we want it to be a, a high load practice today. And today for this athlete, it was, you know, 6.2 set worth of load. Um, makes it a lot more, more usable. Uh, so those are the those are the new main metrics: uh, landing impact and energy. Um, and then as we kind of talk through here, I guess sort of organically, 
we'll, we'll go over how we're how we're taking those metrics and making them, you know, more useful and um, applying it for for training periodization. I got a message saying my internet was unstable. That all come through? Yeah, yeah, I got it just fine. All right, awesome. Uh, we did have one kind of introductory question. Uh, <laughs> How do you deal with players who are throwing their verts around? <laughs> <laughs> well, Lauren's staff pretty much just stopped them from doing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I guess, Lauren, can, can you you can start by just um, – and I'm, I'm a bit curious too – the conversations you had with your players about the technology, just to wear it. Yeah, our, we started using vert um, hardcore just for injury prevention – um, we found that we were getting a lot of injuries uh, like four, five, six years ago. And so um, we wanted to scientifically track it and scientifically train. Um, and so at first they were like, sure, fine, you know, whatever you want. Um, and yeah, w we have one player who would have these huge energy outputs and you could look and it was like the t a water break or something and she's over there just moving around. And so really we just, yeah, slinging it. Um, just had to tell them to stop and that they, they want to jump and they want to train. And so more often than not, we're limiting them. And so they know the less they move their birth, the more jumps they get in practice and the more they can do. So they started, uh, they were real mindful of that. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's, that's happened a few times. You know, we, we've had coaches call us and say, look, we know, we know it's accurate, but we know every now and then you can get a jump height anomaly, but it said she had like a you know, 42 inch vertical and she's our best athlete. And, and, and I'd say, and I look at the data, I'd be like, look, she can hit 33. She's a freak, but no. And then it turns out they were doing, you know, like the dirty dancing thing and, and she'd jump and someone would lift her um, to try to trick it into making it think she jumped higher. But yeah, I, I think it, that's a, it's a great question. Um, I think the way that with JMU and, and quite a few of our other programs, the way we got them to be more serious about it was by sharing some of the data with the athletes um, and showing them that it's, it, it's actually very, very important that they don't add extra work to the staff. Or what ends up happening is my staff, when that happened, for example, we manually go in because we can see it when there's a stupid spike in energy and we can delete it and remove it so it doesn't skew the data. Um, we can also delete jumps so that they don't skew the data and then it goes in and it and it removes it because but once we you know because Lauren staff will go in and actually show them like here's you know where you are and here's where you're playing here's where we want you to be that's not going to be effective if they're screwing around um the the other part of it and I love that Lauren's point is yeah it has absolutely helped I know her staff and a lot of staffs to be just more to get the athletes to be more efficient in their training, right? Take it a, a bit more seriously because you take matches seriously. Let's take our training seriously. Um, but yeah, it's, it's about having conversation and letting them know like, hey, this is, this is fun. We can have fun with you know, your max jumps. And I always say people should do that. Sports science is serious, but have fun. Um, but, but get them to buy in in terms of letting them know like here, this is really to make sure we as coaches are being as accountable as we are for you. Um, and the last thing I'm, I'll take is uh, make it a point immediately to take this seriously. Like, not like halfway through the season. We've had programs do that. Like, oh, come on. Because it's habit. Everything about with these athletes is habit. So if we, they get in the habit of, of wearing them and understanding, like, put it on, forget it's there, go do your thing, um, you'll have a better experience in terms of them not screwing around. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, where do we where do we want to take it from here? I mean, that was basically an explanation of what you guys are collecting. So I suppose we should get into how you're using it. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of ways that we're using the JMU. Uh, Lauren, can you just start off, uh, and then I'll, I'll get into more of the the data side of I think what has been one of the best use cases is kind of our our six v six versus versus match performance comparisons. Yeah, so um, our, as David mentioned, our athletic trainer will flag um, what we're doing in each part of practice. So if it's individuals, if it's six on six, serve, receive, whatever we're doing. Um, and what we did was take the data from our six on six reps in practice and try to make sure that they um, matched 
identically or as close as we could get to what we were doing in our actual matches. Um, and it was super helpful because several players would have um, lower jumps heights or average jumps or max percentage of max jumps in practice than they did in six on six uh, real matches. And what we would do is just tell them and within a day or two those jumps would be equivalent and they'd be going as hard as they were in real matches. And it makes a huge difference, especially with middles, instead of trying to find your middles, that they're, they're jumping their full height. Is that what you're looking for, David? Yeah, no, exactly. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screen share here just a quick example. I don't have, I have some pretty graphs. Some of them are basically, I'm looking at them, and then I'm, I'm sharing it with the staff. Can you see that kind of spreadsheet there? Yep, yep. So this is just a, a quick example. Um, is, you know, we'll sit here and look at, you know, averages for energy output by set, average jump count by set, you know, we'll flag certain things like, you know, this particular player jumps way more in second set, this one jumps way more in first set, so then are there average highs going down after that, um, you know, we see here, awesome consistency, uh, but this is what we were looking at, this is one example where, you know, that week, we look at their, their 6v6, jump heights versus, you know, some person, they were injured, they didn't do much, um, versus, you know, where they are on average in a match. And, you know, our, our key front row players, you'd say, all right, uh, all right, we needed, you know, <laughs> this particular athlete, we need her to, to get higher um, on 6v6. And then other athletes are, you know, right there, they're super close. Um, and it's, it's, it's a simple application because what would end up happening, and it was pretty much across the board, right? I think there's three different occasions where we, we had to bring it up. We do the same thing the following week, and we pull up 6v6 versus their match average. And it was fascinating because suddenly the entire team virtually would be at, even in some cases slightly above, um, their, their match average and average high. And again, that's looking at the top 25 top 25% of, of their jumps. Uh, and so what that, I think the other piece we like to harp on is we look at that match data because A, we want to look at their performance, but B, as you'll see there, we also look at, you know, what is their average, you know, jump count per match, like their average jump demand per match, right? So then, you know, I tell Lauren, like, hey, you know, this six rotation player, you know, her average jump count per match is, you know, maybe 90, 95, right? So if we know that she's 90, 95, physically, we need to have her ready for that. Um, you can actually, Lauren, you can talk about that with, uh, I guess with Briley, right? We had a six rotation player who, she was one of your better players, but what we ended up finding was, you weren't as concerned with getting her reps in because she's a senior player. She's hyper consistent in terms of data. Um, we were able to see that every match she was hyper consistent. Um, so we would find that from a physical capacity standpoint, if we got her around those numbers, we'd never have to, to bring her past it um, versus, you know, younger players who really need those reps uh, who aren't as consistent on the court. Yeah, exactly. And, and with that case specifically, we found later in the season, the second half of the season, her landings were getting higher, high, landing impact was getting higher and higher. Um, and we found that we could do less jumps in practice, which would lower the impact of her landing, which would reduce the risk of injury or long term, you know, bad knees and hips and back and things like that. Um, and she could still perform at the same level and jump at the same height. And matches and so we were able to do that and I think years pass without that data maybe we're still training hard and pushing not knowing that her impacts are heavier um, and maybe you know she has an injury at the end of the season or has a stress reaction or something like that and we prevented her from having an injury um, by paying attention to those numbers yeah no, that's, that's that was a great point that was the uh, I remember that because you, you the landing impacts used for two primary reasons right um one is 
flag that higher injury risk athlete like that's something we would theoretically be doing right now in the spring um is seeing like hey this is this is a person in the spring really need to work on their landings right so let's pull them aside do some work during the season obviously it's incredibly challenging to to work on landings now you can right and what what oftentimes we'll see is athletes landing impacts can improve in practice but when they go back into that match you know, it might spike again because obviously in match, you don't want them thinking, oh, wait, I got to think about my landings now. Um, we want that to become habit in the spring and in the, in the off season and preseason. But yeah, with, with, with that player in particular, it was fascinating because during the season you'll, you'll trend and let's say she's high impact. All we really care about now is this, is that going up or right? is that landing impact going up? Um, and and I think because this is video, I'll give you guys a riveting demonstration of what we're looking at. When we talk about landing impacts, right, if, if that kind of works, you only need to see kind of my hips. Um, if you have athletes, when they fatigue, right, if you have a good landing, we have that nice bend, right, hips, knees, down to the ankles, right, your, your muscular structure is absorbing that impact well, right, along with your skeletal structure. So now it's, you're sharing the wealth of that landing impact. But then what happens is as we get tired, you want to do less of that squat, right? So now we're taking pressure off that muscular structure, putting it in the skeletal structure. That is specifically um, specifically what we're looking at. And so that's why we can be very confident when you start to see that landing number get higher. It's a sign of less flexion, which is a sign of more uh, skeletal mechanical impact. And so, yeah, then we just started to say, all right, well, she's going to play in these games because she's crushing it. She's not complaining, but we can take her down and then monitor her jump numbers and see like, yeah, it's not, it's not affecting her performance at all at, at this point. Uh, one quick thing, uh, David, I don't know if you see this in the chat, but uh, they wanted to be a qu clarification on what you mean when you flag it during practice. Yeah, David, I think the question is referring to on the app how Emily um, flags each. Oh, for the oh, okay, sure. Yeah, when we um, – I'll pull this up here. So all you'll do – and, again, you can do this post on our server or live. Um, this is with our VERT team system. So I guess the clarification, we have VERT coach was just does the jumps. Um, it's kind of our, our entry program. Uh, this is the VERT team system. This is what most of our programs are starting to kind of move to. Uh, and it's, it's a, let's give you a quick example here. Right here, uh, you can create different activity tags. So then you can tag a set and say, hey, we're, we're starting now. All right, we're stopping now here. Um, and what will happen is as this tags on the iPad on our server, uh, myself or anybody from JMU staff could go on and pull a a report i guess it's also important to clarify as part of the conversation no problem i saw the thanks pop up <laughs> um because again i like this to be uh really on the educational side but we have sort of different structures right so you have programs that that have a vert coach platform and they're using that mainly on just jump count and looking at those average high numbers and you can pull simple reports we have vert team system basic where it's it's this application um and you can pull a lot of reports on the ipad and then we have Vert Team System Advanced, uh, and that's what James Madison's program's on. Um, and that's, that's I, I always say that one comes down to, to, to budget and bandwidth. Um, uh, Laura and I and Casey had a, a very a few long conversations where, you know, you, you have a lot of data, and we've made this data easy to use, but, I mean, I guess Lauren can speak to this more than I can, but they wanted to really soak everything out of it as humanly possible. Uh, and so with our advanced program, uh, myself and our staff, will do a lot of the analysis uh, on behalf of the client and with the client, including, um, you know, videos, Lauren, Lauren staff will send us videos. Uh, never in a million years am I going to sit there and say, here's what I think Lauren should be doing from a volleyball strategy standpoint. Um, we look exclusively at, you know, how are they loading? How are they landing? Um, it's, it's more of a biomechanical side. Um, and then tie that in with the data. So it's, it's very objective. So then we can give them something to do in terms of working on something with an athlete, and then we can measure, engage, and see if it's, in, if it's helping. Um, 
but yeah, just a quick, a quick overview too. So, so people understand specifically what we're, we're talking about. Um, unfortunately, yeah, you can't, you know, buy vert coach and, and we don't have the bandwidth to have weekly meetings with everybody who has vert coach. <laughs> Uh, and David, just to add to that, some of the things that have been really helpful with the vert coach or whichever, no, he, whichever one we're on, um, Dave is able to tell us this player's not moving efficiently. So if it's a setter and she has a ton of extra movement, just by looking at numbers, we can then eyeball and notice things better. Or um, maybe an attacker isn't loading as well with their arms and using both arms to get up as high as possible. Um, and those are things that he's actually telling us just by looking at numbers then that we're able to come in and train, which has been super helpful. Well, I guess that'll, that'll, that'll lead us to, um, when you're talking about match data, and I'll do another quick, quick screen share here. Uh, one of the things we also did was, everybody see that okay? Yeah. Um, we would look at, you know, how they were performing set by set with a number of different metrics, right? And this was that one player who's hyper consistent. And again, this is looking at average high. Uh, we, we, we look at a, a bunch of different data. Um, and a lot of that is just to see, we're looking for consistency. But I like to bring up this example because we have, you know, another player who we noticed was, you know, on her, her average highs, really kind of all over the place. And like, gosh, she was just crushing it <laughs> on this particular, I actually know which match this is, um, you know, crushing it on this particular match. And, and what we started to look at, and this is a question you get all the time is, uh, I guess, twofold, A, and this is one of the first questions Lauren would ask is what is a, a low, medium, or high day look like from a jump count or, or load perspective? Um, and then additionally, uh, what is the training periodization look like? So most programs, most programs do sort of that, you know, have our matches, we have a day off, then we start pretty high and then tend to sort of taper off into a match. Right. Physiologically, you want roughly 72 hours for the body to get as close to full recovery as possible from training. So that's kind of where that, that sort of came from. Um, I'll talk about that periodization, then I'll, I'll kind of go into the low, medium, high stuff we do. Uh, but what we found with a particular player who was inconsistent, and this was just looking through data, was she would have her best jump days, even in practice, after the hardest practice. And, and this is where it comes down to, I guess, Lauren staff having to do a little more work on the training periodization because we'd say, well, and we, what, what, I guess we did this with like last month of the season, roughly, mm -hmm. right? Where, so we still took the whole team in the same periodization model, like high, medium, low to simplify. But this particular player, we do more of like a medium, medium, high <laughs> leading into match. And, um, the results actually kind of look like that, where, where suddenly, boom, she started jumping higher earlier in matches because, uh, you know, it's just, it's hard to say. This, it's so particular, these performance metrics, where, you know, as we know, one thing does not work for each player. Each player is an individual. So I think one of the more powerful points of the data is we're able to get pretty specific if you do take a little time and just look and say, hey, after heavy days, you know, we rested everyone else and they were okay, but this player, she jumps through the roof after we kick the crap out of her. Um, we need to be careful still not to do that too much, but let's just kick the crap out of her at a different time of the week, <laughs> and then we can, we can improve that performance and match. Um, I think that was one of my favorite things we kind of stumbled upon last season, and, and that's – this isn't a one-off, right? This is going to be probably have a player or two like this on almost every team. The and just, next, go, go ahead. Just to add to that, the um, the from a coaching standpoint, to be able to tell your athletes, like scientifically, you're going to jump higher if we take this many jumps today, and then the, and they're like begging for jumps too. So it's like, oh, I get to you know, I get 20 extra jumps on this outside today, and they're like so excited, and the other outside's like, Ugh, you know. But I, it's cool to scientifically tell them that. Um, and the other thing that we see is we get more quality over quantity. So they know they only get so many jumps each day. 
and they're going hard in those jumps. Like they don't want to waste a jump, you know. It's sometimes even like it's a bad set or we blew the whistle and they'll purposely just like not jump because they don't want to waste one of the jumps that they get. And you'll find that when you tell them all the scientific data, you're getting so much more out of practice because they understand the value in each of their reps and the number of reps that they specifically get. Well, and, and, and James Madison's actually towards uh, the higher end in average player percent of max jump height in practice. Uh, and we, we actually talked about this where Laura and I had this conversation yesterday, right? Where we're saying like, we, there's different theories, right? But volleyball, and I always say it's, it's not a walk through sport, right? Because it's not, it's not individual. If, if we've got the middle saying, you know, I'm going to be complacent today in practice and, and I, you know, on the one, I usually jump whatever, 23 inches. And today I'm, I'm jumping 20, which we'll see. Then that's, that's going to break down the communication between everyone. Um, so you want to make sure you're efficient. And that's why gauging that performance in practice and saying, we don't want these sub-maximal going through the motions performance, right? We need this to be, we're in game, game type scenario. Um, especially when we're doing any of our 66s. And so that's why we, that's why it's so beautiful in this sport in particular, right? Cause in a lot of sports, you don't have it. You don't have a metric that is so just abundantly useful as jump and landing are in volleyball, right? Um, it's really unique. It's very unique. Uh, and so we were, we were kind of fortunate that this was the sport that found us um, truth be told. So the, the next piece we talked about that periodization is, is that question, right? Cause we, we look at the match data to make sure they're jumping their highest. And, and the way we, we figure out if we're doing a good job is, is how are we periodizing our practices in terms of uh, jump volumes? So the question we are asked more than any other question for the last six years was what is a low, medium, and high day look like? Uh, and I guess a, a brief history, we had a lot of programs start off by saying, hey, I'm, I'm capping at X amount of jumps, um, like 100 or 125. Uh, but then we'd look and say, well, you know, a middle blocker, they're averaging 25, 26 jumps a set. They can get up to 160 in a five-set match. So we need to get them to those numbers. So that the first time they're experiencing that shock to the system, as Luke was talking about last time, is not in the match. Um, they've been built up to it. So, so there we started to – some programs actually we felt were maybe underjumping, and with that data we'd start to, to bring it back up. Uh, but the long and the short is it depends completely – that low, medium, high day depends completely on what have you done. Like how have you built the athlete's physical capacity – because if, if you've been jumping them, you know, 80 times in practice a week, then 110 is a high day. Um, and, uh, you know, 50 to 60 is a low day. If you've been jumping them, if they've built up to, you know, 108, pra 108 jumps uh, on average, then, you know, that's, that's kind of their medium day. And so a high day would be, the research says, roughly 20 to 30% higher than that. A low day would be roughly 20% lower than that. Um, so what we did, and I was doing this kind of manually with Lauren's program, um, and then we, we came out with this right before coronavirus stopped anyone from being able to play with it, which is not depressing at all given it was about two years of work, um, was we, we wanted to say, all right, so like Lauren, as a staff, if, if we're saying what should we be doing tomorrow? Well, the best way to answer that from a load perspective, right, not from a skill perspective, from a load perspective is to say, all right, what has that each individual athlete done? And again, to clarify, when I'm talking about physical capacity, we're mainly talking about tendon capacity, right? Everyone's feared patellar tendinopathies and you know, not necessarily ACL acute injuries, but just those kind of chronic overload injuries. We tend to see those oftentimes when the muscle capacity, like it's a crazy strong athlete, their muscle capacity is just way higher than that tendon capacity. So they're strong, they can jump through the roof, but the tendon's lagging behind. So now that muscle's really pulling on that tendon, it gets inflamed, it hasn't been able to keep up because maybe we spiked 
their jump training, uh, they're jumping too high. Uh, so what what you'll do is you know, you'll you'll pick your your previous data. Oh, that's really bright. Um, let's see if I can do that here a little better. Is that coming out fairly clearly? If I angle it a little bit. Yeah, it depends on the angle. Yeah, um, I can send a screenshot later, perhaps. But essentially, what what it'll do now is we use what's called uh, John. I don't know if you're familiar with the acute to chronic workload ratios. Yeah. So uh, for those listening, um, acute to chronic workload ratio is the basic concept. You take your your seven days of training. So it's your seven days, like what we're doing right now. That's your your shock or your fatigue. And you look at your chronic workload, roughly 28 days. That's what we've done. That's our conditioning, what we've built the body to be able to handle. And it's just a ratio between those two things. So if we were jumping our athletes a hundred times on average every day for the last 28 days, and then this week we jump a hundred times every day, you're at a, a one, right? Um, but as we know in performance, you always want variability for adaptation and improvement. So looking at those basic numbers, we were jumping 100 times, and this week, as a weekly average, we wanted to, to push capacity. We want it to be high. Uh, research shows you want to be between about a 0.8 and a 1.3. If you go above that 1.3, all we're saying is, uh, based on the science, injury risk is going slightly up. The same is if you go below that 0.8, injury risk is also going up. Undertraining is real. Um, when you look at the San Antonio Spurs, when they were some of the first to do the load management that everyone loves so much in volleyball and in basketball, their injury rates, the first time they started doing it, actually went up. Uh, and, and part of that is because, theoretically, capacity is going down. These guys are taking too many games off. Um, so the idea then is we want to kind of play in that area. And so – what we do with Lauren's staff is, you know, um, we'd start them low and then we'd slowly kind of average kind of a 1.1, 1.2 so that, you know, maybe their a medium day at the beginning of the season was, you know, 65, 70 jumps, but three weeks later, a medium days, 88 jumps, right? So that high days is getting closer to, you know, like a heavy match load. Um, so, now, when programs are able to get back to using the system, um, the Vert Team system will actually automatically do that. So you'll, you'll click a button on targets. It'll tell you, you know, where the athlete is. If they've been training really hard, maybe they're at a 1.3. Maybe you guys have been – it's been easy. They're at a 0.8. If that player's at a 0.8, you can push them. And it'll say, here's what a low day is for that player, medium day for that player, and a high day for that player. Because, right, like, Lauren, your, your high day for your middle might be 180, but your high day for – three rotation outside might be, you know, 110. Mm -hmm. So, and also he, it's like, if you have a player coming back from an injury, maybe the high day for that one is 65. But just in the last year using this system with David, it was huge because at the end of the year, we were training at a higher level, getting more jumps than we had the whole season. And usually in the past, I'd have to be, okay, we need to take this day off. We're fatigued. We need to rest and you're getting less reps going into your conference championship, less reps going into the NCAA tournament. Um, but this past year, it was like we, we did some of our heaviest practices at the mm -hmm. end of the year, um, and that's when you want those reps and you want to be playing your best. And the girls felt good. Um, and, and so I, like I, the cute to chronic was a game changer for us, learning all the load and, and the low, medium, high. Yeah, Kevin Hambly talked about this at Stanford, where they realized if they didn't keep the ratio up, where it needed to be, they were having year-end injury problems every year. I think you talked about it on, um, you know, one of the podcasts. I forget which one now. Yeah. Uh, we did have a uh, we did have a clarification for question for you, David. Yep. Um, you're using jump count as your reference in terms of load. Do you use anything else like landing impact or energy or you know any of the others in that in this conversation? As well, for sure. So, um, the, again, the landing impact. We're, we're honestly working on different means of using that as a load. Again, right now we look at that twofold as more flag and trend. We've had a few programs actually almost stop looking at jumps and use that sets by energy or en energy metric uh, instead. Um, and again, sets by energy. So once we have that normalized, we know like a low day for this player would be, you know, 1.8 sets worth of energy 
medium day would be 2.8 and high day would be 4.1, whatever that might be. Um, it's, it's almost two sides of the same coin. You'll find that on your front row players, the correlation between energy and, and jump is really, really similar. Um, but in some unique cases, uh, we start to see that energy going like up, but their jumps aren't. And then we look and see, okay, they're starting to land harder. So now they're working harder, like outside of their jump, if that makes sense, right? The rest of their movement's starting to break down. So when you're looking specifically at acute to chronic, the two main ways is jump count and energy. Um, both of them equally valid. The, the energy piece, though, has been fascinating because now we do have quite a few programs that are using that with uh, liberos and defensive players because, you know, obviously they're, hey, you jumped eight times today. Congratulations. Um, but because that metric is, is picking up any of their dynamic movement, we're able to do things like, uh, I guess this is a quick aside, but it's, I think, very important. Um, and this is something that we actually, I think we talked about towards the end of the season, Lauren, was we found doing some internal research that uh, most programs do a good job of, of their, their front row players getting kind of match loads in practice. But liberos, DSs in particular, tend to be anywhere from 30 to 40% below a average match load in practice. And the reason is, if you had your liberos like diving around like crazy people every practice like they do in game, you know, we, we'd probably see a higher uh, injury rate. Um, but one of the things that a, a pro club in Europe actually started doing was they said, all right, uh, and I'll, I saw a question about sets by energy. I'll clarify it as part of this. They found, you know, took about three, three matches, roughly. You can do more. And because we've tagged each set, we know that, you know, this libero or outside or middle, their average energy, think of it as demand, per set in a match is 500. Again, that's, that's 500 joules per pound. That's an individual number to them, 500 joules per pound. So now in practice, if they practiced and they're at 1,000 joules per pound, that was like two sets worth of load mechanically, right? So if they were at 1,500 joules per pound that day, that was like a three-set load. Um, that's how we, we take that energy metric. And one of the things we did do, which was, was great, was we'd actually go back and say, all right, that was a three-set match. What did, what did our data say for that athlete? Oh, it said 2.9. Awesome, right? Because in the end, it's just a, it's a solid estimate as a guide. Um, but what, what that program started doing with their libero is saying, okay, today's a hard day for our, our, our staff. And we got all of our players up to like a five, six set day. But our liberos and defensive players after in practice are at like a three to 3.5 sets. Well, they got the reps they need. But we want to make sure they're physically capable to handle that five-set match. So what they would do is the strength coach would actually take them aside and have them run through position-specific kind of agility movement until that energy came up to closer to that five-set match. And the reason you do that is it's, it's almost impossible to quantify that, that lost half-step, you know, by your libero in the fifth set which is the difference between a good pass and a shank. But if we, we know we've at least built the physical capacity to handle that much load, then theoretically she'll be ready in a fifth set to have, you know, close to as much explosiveness laterally as she did in, in set one, if that makes sense. And I saw that question. Hopefully that answered the sets by energy question a little better. Yeah, we also had a question on whether or not you use the PSC to support the workload during the training session. So that sounds to me like in practice, are you making adjustments based on the data that's coming through? So that would be a question for you, Lauren, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. So we have our practice plan, and obviously we tell Emily, who's our athletic trainer, going into practice how many jumps our goal is for each player. Usually it's like a 20-jump range. Um, and then she comes over when we're like within 50 of my kind of cutoff, and then she'll tell me when we're within 30, and then, okay, you've got 20. And so she just – and. I mean, there's been days I've had to pull players and they don't get to finish practice or they have to play back row or we don't set them because they've reached their jump count. 
Um, and the more you do it, you get better at like getting the practice plane to match the actual jumps that you want. Um, but yeah, she'll come in and, or if we see someone super fatigued or has had a lot of heavy, a lot of times you'll have hard landings with serves. Um, and so maybe we just say, okay, this player's not going to jump serve as much today. We want to get those jumps and her attacking. But we, we change practice as it goes based on jump count. Okay. And to that point, I'll do another quick screen share here. Um, and again, Lauren, thank you for allowing us to share all this information. So when I, when I talk about proper communication. And I know even in the last, the last uh, conversation you had, John, they're talking about RPEs, those, those rate of perceived exertions, right? So if, if vert represents kind of your ultimate objective metric for performance in volleyball, you know, RPE, as basic as it seems, is your, your subjective. And it, the research behind RPE, RPE is incredibly valuable. You know, people, especially in the, the, the science world, they're almost like, ah, it's, it's so subjective. But again, individual to each player, it's, it's very useful. So what you're looking at here in a nutshell is you have these numbers, three, two, four, three, five, four. So that's Emily, their athletic trainer, getting their, their RPE data. So after practice, right? I think, does she have an app or does she just take it down, Lauren? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when your staff just does their job. Um, yeah. She'll, she'll just take it down and then we'll, she'll, she'll overlay it with, you know, jumps and then in purple is kind of their workload energy. I know they'll also put in some stuff there from, um, you know, wellness with their strength conditioning coach. But what you'll find is if you're looking at, this is almost across the board, look how beautifully it kind of <laughs> goes up and down with jump and energy load, right? Um, and we found that kind of throughout the season. You're almost sitting there from a data scientist standpoint saying, I'm looking for a point where, it's not matching really well, so we can figure out why. Um, frankly, for the most of the season, uh, with most of the players, it, it matched up well. And that is just essentially validating, you know, us and the staff and saying, all right, this is working well. First and foremost, players are feeling good. Um, the, the numbers are matching what we're trying to do. Uh, and so we're going to continue. I think the only, the only real change we – the only – I guess you actually – talked about the third change, the, the, the three main changes we made that were purely data driven, like purely data per player was, you know, the one player kind of tapering her towards the end of the season while the rest of the team was going up because her landings, um, changing the periodization model on the other player. And then I'm actually glad you brought up the, the service, uh, point where, um, yeah, I guess she was that, that athlete was coming back from a lower extremity injury too, correct? Mm-hmm. And we were able to, or you were able to tell that her hard landings came during the time of practice where she was, it was serving past, she was just serving a ton of balls, um, but her actual attack jumps weren't bad, so we just moved more of her jump count to her attack jumps and less on the serve, um, and she was able to continue to get better and not have injury risks. Well, th thanks to Emily tagging the serves, because that <laughs> makes it a lot easier. Um, as, an, as an aside, John, the, in this has been really, really fascinating. Uh, what we have found, and it's almost across the board. Um, I was actually just, I was right before everything happened, I was just in Washington State. Um, and I was, I was with their, uh, the Washington State University staff, and they're another um, advanced client. And, and I was talking to their athletic trainer, and she's, she's like, noticed, you know, we start our practices with serves, and everyone's elevated landings are through the roof. And then throughout practice, it starts to, to go down. I was like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much across the board. I think I'm about to be invaded by my two-year-old, potentially. Um, that's pretty much across the board where we start to see a higher landing impact in a 12 to 14-inch serve than in some cases, in most cases, a 20 to 25-inch attack. And David, just, sorry, just to add to that, um, we did a lot less just we used to rep before i met david <laughs> we used to rep serving out such a huge part of the game and just we would start practice i mean they would serve for 10 minutes straight just serve 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 um and because of the impact we've gone to where we really only do a lot of match serves like they'll do a few to start practice but other than that because there's such high impact landings we get those game reps only and have, have you seen that affect basically serve performance in matches because that's something i don't have access to 
Wait, what was your question? And, ha and, and what I'm assuming is then you haven't seen any decrease in serve performance in game, like in matches. No, absolutely not. And, and to be honest, I think it goes to that quantity quality. So they're getting much better reps in training that correlates easier to matches um, without putting all the extra pounding on their body that isn't necessary. Yeah, I mean, that would be, from a coaching perspective, that would be my expectation is you got them focusing on actually serving the way you want them to serve live rather than, like you say, just repping it out. Let's be honest, a lot of times they're just going through the motions. Mm -hmm. Coach has a serving for 10 minutes, I'll, I'll go back and I'll serve a few balls. Whereas if they're actually serving against their teammates, trying to hit the seam, trying to, you know, do whatever, that's more valuable. Well, and, and uh, to that point, um, I won't name the other client because I don't know if I have permission to, not that it's a big deal, but I was, I was with a number of clients before I had to stop traveling. And um, it was fascinating because we found when they were, well, a couple of their athletes, when they were serving in, it was, a, it was a, I think, two on two, but still, it was more, you know, game style. Oddly, they were landing better than when they were just doing serve reps. More focused. Which, and I, that's the only thing you can kind of subjectively attribute well, to. The, the other thing that I might bring up is if you're just doing reps, you're not thinking, you're not doing anything after the rep. If you're doing a live rep, you're going into the court. So you land and move instead of just land. Mm -hmm. and, just, and, and so and the, the, the question then is why is that landing harder? But to that point, there's a few reasons. One, you tend to have a bit more horizontal displacement, right? And so the, the body's in a bit more of that, that sort of pike position when you come down. So, so oftentimes they're landing flatter or, heck, I've even seen almost the heel hit first before there's any kind of flexion, right? And it's quick. It's really hard to see visually. Like Lauren will send videos and I'm slowing those things down to, to try to grab. Like, all right, we see what the data tells us. You don't see it with the blind eye. But then when you slow it down, you realize, you know, there's a little flexion heel nails the ground and then that crumple zone kind of comes into place as opposed to all of it happening fluidly kind of in a linear fashion but you have those athletes that are in this pike position they're landing hard and then maybe they are thinking like boom plant get in position or drive so we're not even it's not even that anything is happening wrong right it's not like we need to fix the way they land on the serve it it, it very well may be for the most part just part of a service landing but what what Lauren staff has done I think is essentially what should be done where you say right, if we know that now we're just going to kind of fluctuate on our reps there especially if there's an athlete we know has a lower extremity injury um uh, just out of curiosity have you have you taken a look at spin servers versus float servers uh I haven't done like a I won't call it a, a study um but it hasn't been a much of a difference <laughs> which is the fascinating thing. I was looking at with one of our clients, one of their defensive players was serving and she was serving at uh, 10 to 12 inches and landing on average between uh, 14 and 16 G's. And to give you an idea, it kind of goes from zero to 20 plus and anything zero to 10, we consider low to medium on the, uh, or low on the G range. Anything 10 to 15 is kind of medium on G impact range then 15 higher is, is high. But think about it. If she's, she's jumping 12 inches and landing at 15 Gs, whereas, um, you know, the, when she did some fun topspin serves, just for fun, actually, she wasn't topspin server, she was uh, jumping, I think, 23 to 24 inches, and her landing impact was 17, 18, like not, not much higher. Um, still super stiff. It's, it's, there's obviously a correlation between a high, high you jump. Um, but a lot of people think like, oh, she's a heavier girl. She's going to land harder. That's really not true. The way this is measured, um, it's really about mechanics. It's just about how well that energy is being absorbed. So you can have someone who weighs, you know, 100 pounds soaking wet, jump 18 inches and land at 20 Gs just because they don't absorb that impact up the kinetic chain to their center of mass well. Um, so that's why when I said it's across the board, virtually any serve type, any jump height, um, not always, but almost always, their, their serves are some of their highest landing impacts. Okay. Uh, this is 
I don't know, maybe a strange question. Uh, do you ever use the verts in weight training or in strength and conditioning in general? Now, obviously, it doesn't make sense if they're lying on a bench doing doing upper body work. But, for example, if they're doing Olympic lifts or lower body work or, or sprints or something, uh, whatever the strength coach might have them do in a particular session. I'm just thinking in terms of um, load, I mean, load in general, but also maybe also additional information on, on things like, yep. you know, like landing and whatnot. Well, well, Laura, in the spring, we are going to have them on any, any, any of their plyo, not that they do too much off the court, but any of their agility based training, we are actually going to start to see, we talked about starting to see what that looked like. Um, I'll sh let me show you this really quickly and then I'll, I'll specifically answer that question. Uh, you just reminded me, John, we, uh, you know, off court stuff. And so this is something that we do, um, a number of programs do it, but I love the fact that Lauren had her staff do it religiously because we get better data, um, is, uh, in the previous conversation with, uh, Luke and Mark, someone asked about the counter movement jump as a, just kind of a measure of fatigue, um, there was an interesting study, I believe it was out of UBC, uh, British Columbia, where what they found was uh, counter movement jump height is a decent measure of fatigue, but not quite as good as a, maybe sometimes given credit for. And the reason is uh, some athletes, especially your better athletes, when they get tired, you know, the coach might say, hey, you know, she looked tired today. Fortunately, we didn't have a lot of that with with Lauren staff, but coach say, Hey, she looks tired. Is she not jumping as high? And the dad would say, no, she's, she's jumping just as high as she usually does. What you can't see though, is, is it taking her a longer time to make that jump? So that's known as that eccentric load phase when they're, you know, dropping down to, to load into their jump. So the, the UBC study showed that, um, especially the stronger athletes after a lot of training, they could still jump as high, but they were taking a longer time to do it. So we had developed uh, a long, I always like to give credit where it's due. I developed this with uh, Bill Ferran, strength coach of 31 years, I think with the Miami Heat. Um, we developed a, just a bit of a more robust assessment and, and Lauren had her athletes do this every practice after warm up. So it was at the same time um, and they were warm and ready to go. And it's, we refer to it as a, a rebound speed test. So it's a measure of reactive strength. And I kind of go over what that means. Um, but what we're looking at here is they do two jumps, well, three sets of two jumps. They do a max standing jump. And then the second they hit the ground, they do kind of a quick rebound jump. And we would tell the athletes, like, imagine you went up for a max block and you know that ball's coming right back before your feet even hit the ground. You don't have time to drop down and reload. You got to bounce right back up. Um, and what we'll, what we'll calculate, and what's cool is we can do this with the whole team at once, is it'll calculate – their, their first jump height, so that's our, our, our CMJ movement, our counter movement jump measure. So is that kind of consistent throughout the season? And then we'll measure uh, the ground contact time, so how long they're on the ground before that second jump height, and then how high that second jump is. And so you take a, a simple ratio, or a, you just kind of divide that ground contact time into the second jump height in meters, um, and you get what's called the reactive strength index. So all we're looking at to, to essentially simplify is kind of their plyometric ability. And, and I loved it because um, I can pull up these players. We, we did it with the entire team and almost across the board, we saw improvement, but it was great kind of speaking to the objective data. Um, this is a quick snapshot, but you, know, you saw like this particular player here. Um, I was looking at this data and this is towards the beginning of the season. I told Lauren, uh, I, I doubt she's really fatigued at this point. And you know, uh, she said this particular player, um, sometimes we need to push harder. And so I think, Lauren, you guys basically presented the data to her, and, and that ended up happening immediately. Really cool was we saw the exact same thing in her practice data. We saw a spike. We saw an improvement. Um, so when you look at this athlete here, you'll see, all right, the jump heights really – uh, they actually got a little more consistent, but this gray line I means she was jumping just as high in less time now, right? And this is 
uh, actually, I pulled, this is spring. Um, this is a spring data, but her, her match, her, her, yeah, her season data almost looked identical down here. Um, but yeah, so this is what, what this is telling us here is, all right, wow, she's really consistent. So it's like her jump uh, strength hasn't changed, but her power, her ability to get up fast, whew, awesome improvement, right? Because that's her average reaction, uh, reactive strength index. So this is actually what we would look at more closely because if you have someone who's jumping the same height here and here, but they're taking longer to do it now, you know, this number would be down here like this. She jumped, you know, slightly lower, but she also took a lot longer to jump that high. That would be a measure in season of more neuromuscular fatigue, right? So maybe she can still jump as high as she ever could, but it's going to take her a little longer. She might be that half second slower on a block. Um, so this is another thing we did off, you know, not in practice to be able to, to kind of get a little bit more information. Um, but again, it lined up beautifully with our, our practice and match data. And then to answer your other question, um, how's it used like with Olympic lifting, things of that nature. We have uh, a number of automated assessments like this um, that programs use. We have one, uh, I'll kind of go through them really quickly. We have, we've one that programs have done, which is called, we call it a vertical shuttle assessment. And in a nutshell, uh, athletes kind of running the width of the court and it, it's like a shuttle run. At each change of direction, you do a max jump. Um, we ask demand that every time they land, they start with one lateral shuffle, turn and run, plant, jump, lateral shuffle, turn and run. That's purely for safety to make sure they're landing well and not kind of dropping that back knee. Um, but what that allows us to do is A, we'll have 10 jumps. You know, are they, are they fatiguing really quickly? Um, <laughs> with one particular program, um, then a couple, but one particular had a middle blocker jumping three inches higher, moving to her right, then moving to her left uh, consistently. The first time they did this, the program reached out and said, hey, is this right? And I said, I mean, you ran it right. Run it again. Have her start to her left every time. And, yeah, she jumped three inches higher, moving to her right than her left. She's now a right side. This is a SEC program. It actually moved her from the middle. <laughs> <laughs> They're thinking about it anyway, and this is kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, uh, just to, again, you can do off-court things to give you more insights. We have another one that – the, uh, this is not a player favorite. This is a player not favorite assessment where uh, you're familiar, John, with the, the beep test. Yep. It's kind of used, you know, in soccer and rugby and football sometimes. Um, for those of you not familiar, you have two cones roughly 20 meters apart. You, you know, you run to one and then it'll beep. You run the other and the, and the duration of beep time gets shorter and shorter. And it's like, you know, how long can you keep going before you can't make the beep uh, twice? So for fun, we created the same thing vertically. And you'll have the athlete do a max standing jump in the, in the app. And so it'll automatically, after they do three jumps, it'll tell you, all right, here's their max, where they're at, because you don't want them to try to cheat the test. And then it'll run you through a, a sequence of jumps. So three sets of three jumps, rest 20 seconds, three sets of four, rest 20 seconds, three sets of five, rest 20 seconds. Um, not an in-season assessment. And they go for as long as they can before they fall below 80% twice, 80% of their max. And, and it'll tell you, like, hey, you're, jump, you're 25 inches, so you have to stay above 20 inches. Um, and in, in volleyball, honestly, we tend to say to coaches, you don't need to go beyond 70 or 80 because if, if an athlete can handle 70 or 80 jumps uh, in this time frame, we're not worried about their endurance. Um, sorry, I'm going to sit here and stop screen sharing because it's nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Um, but what we're really looking at isn't just how long they can stay above 80%. is we're looking at what happens to their landing as they fatigue. That's been very fascinating um, because kind of going back to that example I showed you where you're taking pressure off that mus muscular structure and put in skeletal structure. We've had a, a number of programs do this um, and they tend to have one athlete who virtually doubles landing impact by the end of that assessment, almost doubles. Um, and so far I think I have uh, about nine or 10 I have good data on. Um, all of them have history of lower extremity and super small sample size but, and, and not at all, uh, I guess, proud or happy to say it, but, but one of them we did say like, hey, you know, if we're gonna flag anything, that we're gonna flag ACL, um, 
on that athlete and the, and the coach almost depressingly chuckled and said, yeah, she blew her ACL two weeks after I ran this test actually. Um, because, and she only got through about 30 jumps and her, her landing increase had doubled within those 30 jumps. She'd never had issues before. Um, we just knew she, she didn't land well and we've been trying to work on it. And sure enough, she was the one we flagged and, and this happened because it physically makes sense. Um, the, the next piece is like Olympic lifting. You can absolutely use an Olympic lifting. I actually, uh, was, I guess, an Olympic lifting coach too for a while. And I would use it to, to look at the peak acceleration on hip extension. It's just not, it's not automated. You have to kind of know what you're looking at. Um, but I have quite a few sports performance institutions I work with who use it for different agility, uh, agility drills, you know, single lateral hop assessments to make sure they're getting full hip extension. Uh, I mean, that could be a whole nother <laughs> long conversation, um, <laughs> the, the application, but, but yeah, you can use it for, uh, quite a few things right now it's being used for poultry research right now for energy, energy expenditure. So <laughs> list, list goes on and on. Okay. We've got two questions. Um, the first one you kind of just touched on, I think is how do you assess the injury risk based on the metrics that you've been talking about? Um, are there different, different response, physical responses to loaded coordinated athletes? Obviously that's true. Uh, yeah, like you were just saying, you could see in the, in the in the landing data that something was really amiss. Mm -hmm. So, well, the, clearly, the, the, a, a, a rising risk of injury. Yeah, I mean, the, the, and that's the thing, right? You have a lot of incredible research and, and a lot of incredible wearable programs that and products that look at you know they'll try to look at you know fifty different metrics over time to try to point to something, right? which is awesome. Again, we're almost fortunate that we're the first to, to do something as, you know, relatively simple as landing impact. And we're in the sport of volleyball because I don't think there's another metric in any other sport in the world that can more directly point to injury risk, like in that sport. Um, it's fascinating. So when, when we were originally doing this before we automated it, it was literally, you know, myself and some of my staff going by hand and looking at, on the server, jump, and then in black, red line, peak acceleration in red. Um, this took a lot of time to kind of set those thresholds. And then we'd obviously do a lot of internal research. I'd have athletes come to the office. I'd videotape them doing different landings to, to, to normalize that low, medium, high, and alert. And then once we had that normalized, we would then, uh, I had the engineer who's, thank God I have him on staff. He uh, automated it. He actually turned that around like a day um, to where the, the sensor would, because we know when the jump ends, we know when there's an impact for landing. Um, he automated it and put it into a histogram so that you can see live on each athlete how many low, medium, high, and alert they had. Um, what Lauren looks at primarily, though, is going to be just, we created on the home screen, elevated landing percent. So what percent is 15 Gs or above? And what we started finding was when you have athletes trending in the 25 to 30% elevated range, that's where we say, you need to take a look at this athlete. Um, we, we don't believe in, in uh, injury prediction, right? We'll never use that. But, but John, I'll tell you, the first 12 athletes I flagged, um, we were doing this by hand, 11 of the 12 I submitted to their staff saying, you know, not to raise red flags, but I think they have a higher risk of hip and back injury. 11 of the 12 had a hip and back injury um, within that season or two weeks after receiving that note. And the one that didn't, and this is fascinating, um, and this is why Warren and I would start to trend some of the athletes down, the one that didn't jumped 40% less volume-wise than her division or her conference outside jumps volume wise. I actually think division one outside jump volume wise. So that's a program that actually advanced program that knew the data. And so they got her to the capacity they needed her to go at and they didn't jump her above it because they know she was a, a hard lander. Um, what's cool is that particular program knew that before we even gave them the data. They're like, yeah, we just know she lands hard. I'm like you guys are awesome because then when they saw the data, they're like, yep. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's the, the main thing on, on, it's, it's just, it's so straightforward. 
on, fortunately. Uh, okay, this we got another question. What's the to is wondering um, how these you know these measurements can potentially be influenced by changes in body weight during the season. You obviously aren't directly measuring body weight, so you're not going to see it specifically. But can you know what you see be be in any way reflective of changes in body composition? Sure, and this is actually a, a, a topic, partially a topic that, that Lauren, Staff, and I discussed earlier, and this goes a lot to uh, the percent of max jump number, where we, we set that at the beginning of the season. So let's say you've got an athlete coming in, she's not in the best shape, and her max jumps, whatever, 20 inches, beginning of the season. And then, you know, later in the season, she's actually, ideally, getting in better shape, you know, maybe losing – weight and she's jumping higher which we see often we see with programs do a, a very good job periodization they will end at higher jumps than they started um and a lot of times the staff will say you know hey what's going on suddenly now she's averaging 88 percent instead of you know 80 83 percent should we change her max jump my argument is always no um because we want to have everyone equal playing ground and all that's telling us is she improved it's kind of up to the staff to figure out why. Is it just because she lost weight, got stronger or not? Um, in terms of landing impact, I can, I can speak to that theoretically because I, I, I can't say that I've had programs say, hey, this player lost eight pounds and her landing impacts improved. Um, but you'd look theoretically as if, if, a, if a player does lose weight, and let's say it's, it's bad weight they're losing – um, then mechanically it's less work for them to drop into slightly more flexion, right? Because their muscles won't be as tired. And so theoretically that should improve landing impact for sure. Um, same scenario. If you have someone who's gaining weight and they're gaining muscle, same thing. They, they can do a better job of taking more flexion, more pressure on that muscular structure. So their landing impact should also theoretically improve um people land uh, they land hard for a few different reasons number one right <laughs> talked about this is all right what do we do now she lands really hard um awareness number one if you ask most athletes hey how much thought do you give to your landing unless it's been drilled into their head by their coaches um oftentimes the answer is none and i've got i've, I've done that with quite a few programs division one programs where they're like, I don't even think about it on court. You want them to get to that point when they land well. Um, but that's awareness. And we've seen dramatic improvements when people just are aware of it. Uh, number two would be the mechanics, understanding just the basics of how to do it. And then three is that, you know, strength and mobility piece, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Do they have the, the strength and hip mobility to get into a proper position? Um, you don't need people squat landing. It's just, the difference of two degrees of hip flexion and not two degrees of hip flexion is m massive uh, in terms of landing impact. Sure. And David, just to, to add to that, we had a couple of players with high landings and Emily, our athletic trainer, would just be monitoring it during practice. So if a player had two or three high landings in a row, she would just kind of go over when they transitioned off or just say, hey, watch your landings. And almost immediately they would go down. So the awareness piece is, is huge. Okay. I'd like to, to transition at least a little bit into how you're using this in match uh, situations, Lauren. You know, what, what either like the kind of the example you just provided with your trainer monitoring jump landings and maybe talking to a player a little bit or what you might be do, thinking in terms of substitution decisions or anything like that. Uh, substitution decisions that it, it doesn't play into. Um, really, it's, it's almost after the match, looking back to make sure that we put ourselves in a position to perform at our highest level. And if so, great, let's keep doing what we're doing. But if our jump numbers are low, first set, second set, third set, fourth, whatever, um, or we're not improving, um, then it's like, okay, what do we need to do training-wise to get our highest output physically during those match days? Um, I don't know, is there anything that you would add to that, David? You know, I'd say, and, and there, there, I know of only a few programs that 
are looking at it live and match. And there have been a few programs that will use it for substitution purposes. Um, that's definitely in the minority, right? And, and I mean, Lauren will test there's certain players where even if their jump height's going down, they're still going to be on the court because they're still going to be, you know, better than next person up at, at, at a particular point. But um, yeah, a lot of it goes into the match data is huge. Like it's, it's absolutely critical. And the, the two main reasons are um, a getting a complete view of that puzzle piece. That is the trainer training load for that athlete. And B we can sit there and say, um, you know, what is a high day this week? Well, the high day this week is actually a little bit higher because that three set match, you, know, you clobbered the other team and we, we didn't get a lot of jumps in um, as opposed to that was a brutal five setter. So even though in theory, we like to start with a high day, we're going to start with more of a medium, medium to medium high day because you know, that was, that was vicious. <laughs> Um, this is I, I, kind of a bigger picture pr question, I suppose. Uh, how high of a capacity are people building out there? Um, what are your takes on tendon strength with periodization? For example, USA needs to train its athletes for a year-round season. Man, you, you, USA is a fun one. I, I, I talk a lot with Jimmy over there, and – he would kill to have access to his athletes for, you know, months and months at a time to do training, but that's not reality for them. Um, we actually built <laughs> in part for Jimmy <laughs> was uh, part of that, that targets thing, you know, the huge chronic workload ratios, you know, he might have his athletes for eight to 10 days. Um, and so we actually had to build it into where after three sessions, he could still pull that and the system will, will assume that they have done that for a longer period of time just to give them, cause he likes to just have that, that solid guide to make sure he doesn't over or under, under train. Um, but, but yeah, that, that periodization model is insane. Um, but the, uh, with the acute to chronic workload, this is kind of where, cause with all these things, you have people who swear by it and people who are like, well, it's not the end all be all. Nothing's the end all be all. Um, here's where I caution. And actually, Mark brought this up in your last talk, um, which was brilliant, where he said when he starts his spring, he always, you know, he starts low. And then he, he builds them up. He said you, you, you really can't start too low in terms of, of increasing injury risk. You can bring them up. But you can certainly, if you overtrain too fast, you're kind of screwed. Um, and to that point, uh, Patrick, one of our lead analysts, I think it was like two years ago, we actually pulled a, we did an internal study. We pulled, I think about 12 programs or so where we looked at six of them that in spring would start at like, you know, 40, 50. And then you could just see that step ladder go up. And then we pulled a bunch that started like 100 plus and across the board, the ones that did this during spring would end with roughly one inch to an inch and a half overall team average improvement in jump height. And we had the exact opposite <laughs> on the other side where they'd end the spring with a roughly inch to inch and a half decrease in overall average jump height. Um, and I would say specifically, it's because you can't come in with this mentality of, of beating them right away. You have to build that capacity. Um, so, but here's where, where you have to caution people to keep chronic. If you start them really high, right, you started a hundred jumps right off the bat for let's say, um, and then you look at your acute to chronic and you're, and you're slowly building them up and you look at your acute to chronic 30 days later, you could be up to, you could be up to 300 jumps and still be like later in the season and still be within your acute to chronic workload ratio. Right now, theoretically, all right, injury risk, you've still done a decent job, um, might not be that much higher, even though you're jumping that high in season. The concern, and there's not a lot of research on this yet. Um, I've been trying to do some kind of anecdotally, just reaching out to former players. The concern there is, especially in a, a, a program or sport like volleyball, is I just get worried about, you know, you only so much cartilage in the knee. Um, and when the athlete is done playing, or if they move on to even next levels, then, yeah, that, that will end up having a potentially long chronic 
issue. So even though you're in that acute chronic workload ratio, it's not this end all be all gold standard. We're good. It's where did you start? And then uh, what I, the argument I would make is just make sure that you know, you're able to go above that, those match demands, but you don't have to, you don't have to crush it. Um, and one thing I will say without, without pointing out any particular programs from, <laughs> we haven't released this before. Laura and I have talked about it. Um, I think John, you and I may have talked about it too, is we've gone back and, you know, Sweet 16, Elite Eight, Final Four, championship games, oftentimes, actually almost always, the majority of those programs are using our, our, our system, one or the other. And it's, it's very fascinating. We can sit there and see, you know, this team, this top level, top level team, just beat this top level, top level team. Athletes are incredible on both sides. And I happen to know for a fact that the team that won, in, in some cases, jumps less than half as many times on average in practice than the, the team they just beat. Um, and we, we've seen that quite a few times. So again, it goes back to Lauren, like her strategy of the just quality over quantity. And it's finding that happy median between physical capacity and getting the reps you need. Um, but there's, there's certainly some semblance of ceiling, even though it's going to be individually based to where, you know, you can't take the acute chronic uh, as Bible, right? It's a guide, right? It's, sure. it's a really, really good guide, but that's what it is. It's just a, it's a guide giving you some parameters. Okay. I think uh, maybe a couple of years ago, you guys published like jump count averages by position. Am I yeah, so we're, we're actually getting ready to um, release a lot of those kind of reports. Um, a lot more, information now. We're actually doing by set averages now, by set averages by position, splitting up practices versus games. Um, so we'll be doing some some e-blasts actually starting I think tomorrow. Um, uh, and and part of what we're doing, John, is we're taking this time because I'm not analyzing any new data <laughs> um, to, to just kind of go back and really dig in, um, you know, for fun, but also for, you know, posterity to say, hey, what else can we learn? Uh, and then just share it. And we're sharing it with clients, non-clients, everybody, just for fun conversation banter on video calls um, to, to see, all right, so what is the average? How do we compare? Um, we're going to see how many division things we can do as well. That will take a little more time. Um, yep. But, yeah, I'll, obviously, I'll let you know as soon as those are out. Well, the, the reason I brought up is because for a while there, somebody or some bodies were spreading this – this idea that the average volleyball player jumps 300 times in a match, which is a completely ridiculous number. I have no idea where they could have possibly gotten it from. Cause all you have to do is just start, you know, doing the mess of it. And you're like, yeah, nobody gets close to that. Average outside per set is around, and we'll have, we'll have the real numbers here soon, but is around 20 jumps a set. The average middle is maybe 25 ish, 26 do the math. <laughs> um, well, yeah, that was the, the thing. And I actually, I wrote about it at the time. I was like, all right, listen, okay. The player who could potentially jump the most is, is probably the setter. If they jump set every single ball, they block on every single play that they're in the front row. And even they're not going to get close to 300 because there just aren't that many hitting and blocking opportunities yeah, that are it, going on. It's uh, yeah. I think, I think I may have seen what you wrote about it, actually. But yeah, I remember seeing. It, I'm like, no, no, no one's gonna get the three. <laughs> like I said, when when I, like I did the uh, when I presented ABCA, it was, um, you know, like that. That was a. I think one of the, the best things we're able to pull is that whole, you know, for your your three rotation outside, one twenty is is kind of that top end number you're looking at. Can it be broken? Sure, but rare. That's five set match. And for your, your you, you got a outside 160. Um, there was a SEC player last season, and it was cool because we actually did it with volumetrics as well. She had more than more swings than any other uh, Division One outside, um, and she also had more jumps according to our data in match. She averaged 33 jumps a set, and and she was most she was most in the country. Yeah, right. So she would actually get up to. 180, 190, um, again, rare five-set matches. But 
Um, that athlete also went four seasons without missing as much as a practice because their program does a phenomenal job monitoring her. But, um, but yeah, it was, but that's it. I mean, she jumped more than anybody and she, she wasn't getting anywhere close to three, 300. Yeah. All right. I don't have any more questions that have come in. Um, well, I know we do have one request in the chat. If you'd be willing to share your, your email group. No, sure. Can I type that somewhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can type. Just type it in the chat. Just uh, yeah, down the bottom. You can pull up the chat window. Yeah. Uh, while he's doing that, Lauren, anything? Any additional comments from your perspective on you know how you're using the data or where you're looking to take it or anything like that? Not that I can think of. Just David's the man, and he makes it easy to understand and just tells us what we need to know. So I highly recommend him. All right. Very good. Uh, any additional comments from you, David? Um, at, at this point, um, no. I mean, as Lauren can attest, and I think you too, John. I'm, I'm a talker. I'm also an open book. So, so what we're kind of doing is, um, I guess I could. Let me do this. This might actually, this might be advantageous. Give me one second. I'm going to put in a, a link, and this is kind of what we're sending out. Um, all I'm doing right now <laughs> is, is just doing calls, right, John, uh, with a clients like Lauren going over different things, looking back at, at previous, um, data, but then also what we're trying to do is, uh, just have video calls. So I'll put in a link right now. If people would find that helpful, I'm just trying to pull it up here. Um, there we go. And this is, uh, this is just something I'm sending out. So if, if anybody, and again, this is clients obviously know it, but even beyond clients, even people are like, Hey, my budget is fully frozen. We don't, I don't really care at this point. I'm not actually in sales. I just like to have these conversations because in having these conversations, a, yeah, people learn a lot more from the data, but then they always, I'm still always shocked with questions I'll get. I'm like, all right, you know, that's, that could be something we could work in just so that we kind of, uh, improve across the board. So people can go in there and they can literally look into my calendar, which will go from very full to very open sometimes, especially now, um, and just grab a slot and then we'll, we'll jump in and do video calls. Okay. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks you both. I'm sure everybody got a lot out of this. Uh,